Good science makes good policy, or so it's said. But a growing chorus of scientists in the federal public service say they've been sidelined and silenced under the Harper government. Steve Campana is one of them. He recently quit his job as a senior scientist with Fisheries and Oceans after 30 years there. Disgusted, he said, by a toxic atmosphere that constrained his research and kept him from discussing his work with the media. Joining us now with more in Reykjavik, Iceland via Skype, Steve Campana, professor in the Faculty of Life and Environmental Sciences at the University of Iceland, and with us here in studio, Katie Gibbs, Executive Director of Evidence for Democracy. Katie, it's good to have you back on the program. And Steve, I'm going to start with you uh, over in Iceland. Uh, I guess off the top, i got to ask you, why'd you leave Canada? Well, it's, uh, it had actually reached the point in fisheries and oceans where I was working that I, I was just too frustrated to, to do my job. And uh, as you pointed out, I've been there 30 years, actually 32 years, and I just love the science. I, I didn't want to leave that behind, but I, 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 the last few years have just been unconscionable. So I, I decided to make the move, and, and here I am, and I'm still doing basically the same type of work that I did in, in Canada. It's just that I'm doing it in a much, much more positive atmosphere. What changed over the last few years? It was a whole host of things, Steve. Uh, you know, we've had a, a long-term slide in the amount of research funding that we had available. So it wasn't that. It, you know, we're perfectly capable of going out and seeking other funding. It was more the, the non-financial roadblocks that were put in our place that seemed to be put in the place solely to impede our ability to do science or to report on it. And uh, for, for someone like myself who was heading up the Shark Research Lab in Canada, and sharks, of course, you know, they get a lot of, a lot of attention from the public, from the media, and it's the type of thing that you want to be able to share with, with the people, the, the taxpayers that are paying for it. And uh, we, were, we were stopped from doing so. And uh, it was just, uh, it was too much. I had to leave. One more question before I get Katie in. And you say non-financial roadblocks. What's a non-financial roadblock? Who stopped you from talking about it and how? Okay, well, it's actually a multi-part uh, answer. But it, I guess one of them is, uh, you know, the prime focus of, of why we're here is the, the muzzling aspect. So uh, we were uh, given very explicit instructions that we were not to communicate to the media without prior approval. And uh, very often when you, when you uh, uh, asked for that approval, you didn't get it. So uh, that, that was one very clear example. And it, I'm not talking about policy issues or, or things that might uh, you know, potentially impact the, the way the government is viewed. Uh, these were totally uh, non partisan, um, very often real interest stories, things like uh, where poor beagle sharks go to give birth, something that has no policy implications for the country, but we, we were not allowed to talk to, to it about the public or to the media. Yeah, who put the stop sign up? Well, you know, it's, it's hard to tell where it actually came from, Steve. Uh, I suspect ultimately it came from the Prime Minister's office, but I'm guessing there. I, I know certainly it came uh, we were told from the very highest levels within the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and, and they got their message from somewhere else. Okay. Katie, that is Steve's experience. Yeah. How anomalous is that experience in your experience? Well, it, it isn't. Unfortunately, uh, the same kind of story is what we're hearing from government scientists across the board, and certainly other DFO scientists and Environment Canada scientists. Um, the same sense that, you know, obviously they're, they're really frustrated with this muzzling situation where they can't, um, communicate their research through the media to the public, um, but also other frustrations around not being able to attend conferences is a big one. Um, so no longer able to go to those scientific conferences. Which, is that because money was tight? Well, part of it is that certainly the budget for attending conferences was cut, but I've also heard examples of scientists who are willing to take vacation days and pay their own money to go to conferences, and the, the request was still denied. Um, so, you know, and going to conferences is really essential as a researcher. You know, that's where you meet collaborators, that's where you hear about the cutting edge research. Um, in addition, there's sort of been more administrative burden put on scientists as well. So sort of all of these different roadblo roadblocks that make it really hard for them to actually do good science. Now clearly, Stephen Harper doesn't get on the phone and call his uh, fellow Stephen Campana in Fisheries and Oceans and say, I don't want you attending this conference or I yeah. don't want you talking to the media. 
So again, I need some more clarity on how the sort of word goes forth yeah. that interviews are not being given, conferences are not being attended, and so on. Yeah, well, so most of the departments actually have their own department-wide communication policy that deals with how scientists can talk to the media. And a lot of those departments did actually have very explicit changes to the policies um, starting around 2007, where they now made it very explicit that scientists could no longer just talk directly to a journalist like it used to be, that now instead they had to actually go you know, through the communications department and get approval beforehand. And what we've seen is this has almost resulted in, you know, I almost call it muzzling by bureaucracy. Um, so thankfully we've had some really great journalists who when their interview request was denied, they filed access to information requests. And so what we've ended up seeing in some cases is literally like 500 pages of emails being returned of different levels of government and different bureaucrats discussing whether or not the scientists could do this interview. I think I've got an example of what you're talking about right here. This is from last year, a request by Canadian Press to speak to a, a federal government scientist named Max Bothwell about work on algae. Yes. There was a 110 page email exchange to and from 16 different federal yes. communications officers. The media rep, Steve, let me get you back in here on this one. The media rep for the Minister of State for Science and Technology, Scott French, said, quote, while ministers are the primary spokespersons for government departments, scientists have and are readily available to share their research with Canadians. Does that not jibe with your understanding of things? That's certainly not the case. Uh, we were. Uh, and I personally have been disciplined several times for speaking to the media with, without approval, despite the fact that I had quite a track record in, in terms of already uh, speaking to them in the past about, about uh, shark issues and, and other things. And, uh, you know, to take a perfect example, um, there was an incident where there was a great white shark that was filmed following a kayaker down in the United States in, uh, in the water and never attacked him. It was just a very uh, striking video. So I was asked to go on, on TV to, to just talk about this, this issue in America, and it, again, had no implications for Canada. And after that interview aired, then I was hauled into uh, my senior manager's office, and I was uh, disciplined for, for speaking without, without approval. Disciplined and, how? You know, uh, well, it was, a, it was a verbal discipline uh, with the, the threat of further action if I, if I did anything additional. Hmm. And what, uh, did you ever but, say to your senior manager at any point, what exactly is it that you're worried I'm going to say that causes you concern? Well, I, I didn't really, I'd never asked him that because I knew that it wasn't, the message wasn't coming from him. It was coming from on high. And I did try and clarify exactly um, what the, the boundaries were in terms of uh, what I could say and who I could say it to. But it was made very clear that I couldn't, say anything without that approval and and very often that that approval just was not given it wasn't as if I was told no although that sometimes that happened very often it just sat in in limbo uh, for for months on end it never happened Katie same question what what, what was it that scientists were told uh, was the concern that they would say that would somehow be off message from what the government of the day wanted well, that's just it. Is they, you know, there wasn't any any clear message on that, and you know, it really was just the sort of you can't say anything without approval. And then, you know, it, very much what Steve experienced, I think, is is happening across the board. That it wasn't in most cases, it wasn't an you know an explicit you can never talk to the media. It's just that you have to get approval first, which sounds in theory like that could be benign. But then the problem is, you know, again, and we've seen from these huge paper trails from access to information requests, that often, you know, journalists, as you know, you know, journalists have a very tight turnaround time. So often their deadline is the same day or the next day. And so, you know, the scientist isn't getting approval back for a week later. And so the deadline has passed. Um, we're, al we're also seeing that instead of being approved to do a phone interview, for example, um, instead the journalist has to submit written questions. First the questions have to get approved, then they go to the scientist, the scientist writes responses, then the responses have to go back to the communications department and get approved, and then the responses will get passed on to the journalist. What do you think of all that? Well, again, I think the muzzling by bureaucracy sums it up best. I mean, that's not, you know, obviously that is not going to be the same as having the journalist being able to actually talk directly to the scientist hmm. on the phone like it used to be. Steve, let me play devil's advocate with, for a second with you here. If, for example, um, an employee at the Royal Bank uh, 
Some journalist calls up and says, you know, I, I, I want to I know what it's like to be a teller in this day and age of increased automation. And the, the employee at the Royal Bank just can't go give that interview. The employee at the Royal Bank's got to go through channels and get approvals and so on because they're employees. And managers have to approve these things. Why, why should it be different for scientists? I think it should be different for scientists because of the nature of the work that we do. So when I was working for Fisheries and Oceans, I was doing a lot of research that was funded by the Canadian taxpayer. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that research, therefore, it, I think ethically belongs to the people of Canada when it, when it comes out. So it's, the, uh, it's information that was paid for by the public and, uh, and we're being stopped from, from, from sharing that information. So in your bank example, you know, there's a potential, I think, uh, if, if the employee said something about, uh, oh, it's not a great job, it might cast negative aspersions on, on the bank, and you can understand that. And similarly, we had uh, long-standing uh, procedures in place that prohibited the scientists from commenting on departmental policy or on uh, national policy. And you know what? Nobody has any trouble with that. I mean, the scientists are not policy people. We, we shouldn't be commenting on that. But when the, when the prohibitions extend to raw facts, scientific observations, scientific papers that are already published, you really have to wonder what's going on. Katie, are you on side with that as well? You, you, you appreciate there have to be some limitations here? It can't just be the Wild West out there? Yeah, and I think we, nor we normally talk about it in sort of three different categories. Mm -hmm. There's talking about, scientists talking about their science, which I don't really see how anyone could disagree that they should be able to do that. Then there's sort of going one step further, which is giving some potential policy implications of their research, uh, which I do think that they should be allowed to do that as well. I think that given you know, that they're the experts on this research, if it's very policy relevant work, that they should be able to give those implications. Um, but that one is certainly more gray area. And then the third one is actually giving their own opinion um, on government policy. And so there certainly is that, that gray area there. And so I think there does need to be you know, communications training for scientists. And many government scientists have been through that training. Um, so certainly the government communications people can work with them to help them understand the distinctions between those things. Um, but certainly on you know, that sort of first bucket of government scientists talking about their science, I don't see how anyone can disagree with that. You're on social media, right? You're on Twitter. I am, yes. In fact, you're at? Katie Gibbs. Katie Gibbs. There yes. you go. Easy to find. Did the, did the restrictions, I don't want to say prohibitions because as you point out it wasn't quite that, but did the restrictions or limitations on what you were able to do in terms of communicating your work extend to tweets and Facebook and social media as well? Well, for the government scientists that I know, I mean, they're very cautious about uh, most of them that I know who are on social media have anonymous accounts that aren't linked um, hmm. with their names. Um, and certainly they feel um, that this chill does extend to what they do in their free time. And I mean, we've seen that with the example of the, the folk song from the Environment Canada scientists. You know, certainly there is this feeling that... Well, that's political, um, though. That was, that was <clears throat> I mean, yeah. for what it's worth, that's way more political than anything we're talking oh, that, about here that today. That is, absolutely. Um, but it's sort of the sense of, you know, your duty as a public servant um, extends even beyond your working hours when you're just an individual, you know, you don't have your work name tag on um, and so you know the, the government scientists that I know are being very very cautious. Steve I want to get a better understanding of what you believe to be the long-term implications of this communications policy by this federal government. What do you think they are? Well, I think the the implications uh, extend in several directions. Um, one of them certainly is if a a scientist is uh, discouraged from from sharing his or her research with with other scientists or with the public. Uh, it puts a it puts a damper on basically his work life and his enjoyment of his life or her life. And you know the typical scientist loves their job. The typical scientist loves to do science, and it's not unusual to to go into a workplace on in evenings or on weekends, and and the scientists are working there. With no overtime, they're just doing it because they love it. And so when you take someone like that in any profession and you discourage them from wanting to do the work, you know, their productivity is going to suffer. And so I think that's uh, certainly one of the issues that's going to happen. Um, the other issue is that right now, for instance, uh, a lot of scientists are even prohibited from uh, talking to scientists um, uh, 
uh, not just in conferences, but in, in as part of work planning with, say, with other countries. And, and a perfect example is there are a number of scientists in Canada that are, are working up in the Arctic on, uh, you know, the potential for seabed resources there. And these are big, well-funded programs where they're collaborating with scientists from, from in other countries uh, around the Arctic. And uh, they've been prohibited from, from speaking to their collaborators. So that's act, actually affecting their work altogether. Hmm. So there you have an example where it could actually be affecting, uh, you know, the, the future potential growth, economic growth of the country. Katie, I'm down to my last minute here, and I want to ask, I, you know, I don't know, but my hunch is a lot of people see a thriving democracy as freedom of speech, freedom yes. of religion, freedom of assembly, and so on. Yeah. The right of scientists to say what they want when they want isn't enumerated in the Charter of Rights in the way that those freedoms are. Mm -hmm. But your group's called Evidence for Democracy. Why is science yeah. important to democracy? Well, I think especially this issue of scientists being able to communicate this work to the public. I mean, you're absolutely right. The foundation of our democracy is having an informed public who you know knows what's going on and can make informed decisions. Um, and I don't see how they can do that unless they have this this valuable information from our scientists. So for us, you know, as much as we are concerned about what this is doing to science and the ability of government scientists to do good work, What's more concerning to me is that this information is no longer getting out to the public, which means we, we no longer have that informed public that is so essential for a healthy democracy. Understood. We've obviously invited conservative uh, government, conservative party spokespeople to come on this program numerous times, and so far we haven't had any luck, but uh, we'll keep trying. Yeah. Steve Campan, it's good of you to join us on the line from Reykjavik, Iceland via Skype. Thanks so much for contributing to our program tonight. And Katie Gibbs, thank Executive you. Director of Evidence for Democracy, we thank you for being here as well. Thanks for having me. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.